this is Andrea Kuypers here with Quidgets interviewing the fantastic, multi-talented meteorite man himself, Mr. Jeffrey Notkin. Um, oh, so, thank you. I feel a little shy now. Yeah. <laughs> Um, how are you enjoying the ISDC Space Conference so far? Uh, okay. I know that you're more in, uh, the, into the rocks, you know, but... <laughs> well, I am a meteorite specialist, but I cannot be any happier than when I'm surrounded by spaceflight enthusiasts. And I, I, have, I have followed every step of the space program since I was a kid. I was allowed by my parents to stay home from my horrible British private school to watch the moon landings when I, when I was very young. And so it gives me great joy and excitement to see so many people here focused on the future of spaceflight, not just talking about how great it used to be. And also, when we do have the, some of the pioneers like Buzz Aldrin himself here, you've got, you've, got the, you've got the original generation of space flight and you've got the new up and coming generation of space flight and it's just it's a great time to be alive to, to witness this passing of the torch. Absolutely, I completely, completely concur. Um, so what does it mean to you to be a meteorite man? Uh, it means a lot of hiking around in the wilderness right. and, uh, you know, cuts and scrapes, bruises, encounters with wild animals, uh, a couple of times being chased off people's property with shotguns. That was an accident. We don't, we don't do any trespassing. It's, it's, it's an opportunity for me to contribute something to the world of science. And the study of meteorites allows us to start to grasp in concrete terms how the solar system formed, what's happening on other bodies in the solar system, so which asteroids are active, how do meteorites get here, what can they teach us about not just the makeup of, of the worlds around us, but about space travel and learning how meteorites get here, how they travel through the atmosphere, how they ablate, how their shapes change has actually influenced spacecraft design. So it's not that big a stretch that I'm here. No. And my, my humorous take on it is my work involves collecting junk that falls out of the sky <laughs> and the people here are trying to get sophisticated, sophisticated equipment into the sky. So we kind of got it bookended. But right, exactly. There's obviously a big connection between that those two obviously um, so um, now um, what do you um, if I was to go out and find a rock in my backyard how would I be able to tell that it's actually from outer space just bring it over to my place okay. we'll, no I shouldn't encourage that <laughs> we actually we receive many samples each year so the the easy answer is to begin with what we call the magnet test mm -hmm. almost all meteorites are rich in iron so the first thing we do if we're not sure is to see if a magnet will adhere mm -hmm. Now, meteorites are not magnetic, they will stick to a magnet, and just because you find something that sticks to a magnet doesn't mean it's a meteorite, but that's the first step. And then, there are a number of excellent online guides. You can, you can do a web search for, I think I found a meteorite, what do oh, I do? Nice. Yeah, and I'm in Googled. fact, on, on my website, Aerolite Meteorites, we have a very detailed step-by-step -step guide to meteorite ID and some tests that you can do at home. And really it's a question of study and becoming familiar with surface features. Remember that in order to get to the surface of our Earth, a meteorite has to have blasted through the atmosphere and melted and burned. Mm -hmm. So freshly fallen meteorite will have a black rind on it called fusion crust because it's actually been superheated to such a degree that the outer surface has become toasted. It looks a bit like... Like, like a crispy a, marshmallow. Yeah, or a charcoal briquette, briquette or a really badly burned piece of toast, which is what happens when I try to make toast. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, so, um, how can you tell where the meteors, ha the meteorites, have come from? Well, that's the tricky part. That's an excellent question. Now, we know for a fact that we have meteorites on Earth that originated on both our Moon and Mars, and quite a number have been recovered. It's a little bit tricky identifying them. The lunar meteorites have been shown to be a geological and chemical match for Apollo return samples. Oh, wow. So by comparing the makeup, the composition of lunar meteorites with the Apollo return samples, we get, a, we get a pretty good match. So if we find a rock on the surface of the Earth, it's obviously a meteorite because it's got, it's got burned fusion crust. Right. And then we do a petrologic ma match to moon samples, we, we're covered. I find the Martian meteorite samples even more interesting and most, many or most Martian meteorites have teeny amounts of gas trapped in them. And if those gas pockets are analyzed, they're shown oh. to be a match with the Martian atmosphere. But I should say that only a teeny percentage of recovered meteorites come from the Moon and Mars. Most originate in the asteroid belt in our okay. own solar system. 
And so spectroscopic analysis mm -hmm. has allowed us to take the first steps toward matching meteorites we've recovered on planet Earth with their parent bodies in okay. the asteroid belt. And that's really exciting to that's me. That's <laughs> so, no, that's, that's so, so exciting. And you said that we've only found um, meteorites from our solar system. Do you think that we'll ever find meteorites here on Earth from a different solar system, or is that just too... Well, it's certainly possible, but we, we've got two hurdles. The first mm -hmm. is the distances between solar systems are so gigantic right. that it would take a really long time for, for a here. rock from another solar system to get here. Mm -hmm. And the odds of it entering our solar system with all the possible... Trajecto trajectories out there makes it unlikely. But the really tricky part is how would we know? We assume that all of the elements in other solar systems must be the same as the elements here. Right, right. So if we were hit by a rock that had incredibly originated in a neighboring solar system, we may just never know. Right. But I would say the odds are against it, based mostly on distance. Mm -hmm. Although if you find one, let me know, because it would be oh, worth I, I definitely will. You'll be the first person I come to, the meteorite man. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so um, let me see. Uh, so you're you're right now you're uh, on the science channel, correct? With the meteorite men, you are also you have two books out. Do you I have do. anything else that you're working on besides I do. being a musician and a world traveler? And <laughs> well, I'm speaking at ISDC. Right, that's the main yeah, thing. The speaker here. <laughs> I'm the host of a of a very exciting educational television program for younger viewers called STEM Journals, and this is filmed largely in Arizona. And our client is Cox Creative, which is the the media. Uh, arm of the world famous cable company. So we have two production teams, Deep Sky Productions and Painted Black Productions, two brilliant writer-directors, came up with the concept for the show. And instead of just doing another science show about, oh look, you know, here's how we do archaeology or here's how right. we build an airplane, the idea is to engage students and make them want to be part of these advances, fascinating advances that are happening all around us in STEM related fields. So one of the aims of the show is to bring students on. So in every episode I have what we call a young STEM investigator who travels around with me. We've investigated robotics, alternative energy, archaeology, astronomy, you name it. If we haven't done it already, we will be doing it. Uh, high on the list is an aerospace episode. So I'm, I'm talking to people and looking at possible content for that here. And you can watch the show anywhere in the world at cox7.com or just Cox do a search for STEM journals. Okay. We're, we're very proud of it. And I, I, am a, I am a very loud advocate for science education. <laughs> That's for fantastic, young as are we. <laughs> so know. absolutely. So it's wonderful to, instead of just be saying, oh, we need better science education, you're doing it, we're doing it. Exactly. I'm, I'm fed up with sitting at home and complaining about how things aren't as good as they could be. We're trying to change that <laughs> exactly and that's fantastic Thank you. It's, uh, well this has been a real pleasure My jeffrey pleasure, will Andrea. not keep you any much longer from the rest of your adoring uh, public and okay. your adoring fans here <laughs> so thank you so much and we will definitely include a link to his website to the sem journals on uh, quidgets so thank, thank you. you very much <laughs> keep up the great work <laughs> thank you